Hey everyone, Kyle here with another video. Tonight what I want to do is I want to talk to you about DeepSeq R1, which is the latest reasoning model out of China that is completely shocking everyone in the AI industry and possibly making the sky fall for certain companies. Now, if you're new to my channel, you may not know that I like to give these kinds of models difficult physics problems because that's what I studied in school. And so I did come up with one problem to give DeepSeq R1 and compare it with OpenAI 01 Pro, as well as Google Gemini Experimental Thinking 2.0. And so if you stick around in the video, I'll show you the results just very briefly. But what I first wanted to do was just talk to you a little bit about what DeepSeq R1 is. This is the research paper that they released when they released the model. You can see up front in figure one, it's their benchmark performance of DeepSeq R1, comparing it with OpenAI 01. And you can see that it is achieving very comparable performance with O1 on various benchmarks ranging from math to coding and science questions. And one of the things that is just really shocking everyone in the industry is that the price, right? First of all, it is free in the sense that you don't have to pay anything to use R1. They've open sourced the model, they have open weights. Compare that to OpenAI 01 Pro, which costs $200 a month to access and is closed source. And if you look here at the input slash output pricing on this graph here in terms of how much you know, money it costs for input and output, uh, it's just completely just shocking how much cheaper DeepSeq R1 is in comparison to O1 from OpenAI. Now, again, we have to, I think, before we completely lose our minds, we do have to take all this with a grain of salt. I don't believe this was independently verified. I believe this is a technical report that was released. It's not like a, a peer-reviewed paper, unless I'm, I'm, I'm wrong about that. I don't think it's a peer-reviewed document. Maybe it is, if people can correct me, but I don't, I don't see that it's being published somewhere in a peer-reviewed journal. That might not matter to some people, but just want to put that out there that we have to take what they're saying at face value. And I don't believe we have any independent analysis yet. Again, I could be wrong. If I'm wrong, please let me know. I know all this is happening really quickly and then the information just sometimes isn't just reaching me. And there's just a lot of crosstalk happening on the internet. With all of that being said, let's jump into the problem that I gave the AI models. So the problem that I gave it from physics is from the subject of electrodynamics. Specifically, it's an electrostatic boundary value problem. And it's a variation of a problem that is found in classical electrodynamics by John David Jackson. Now, of course, I didn't want to give it the exact same problem and word it the exact same way because who knows, maybe the book is in its training data, maybe. But to be safe, I varied the problem and gave it some pretty funny boundary conditions just so that we can be certain that it hasn't seen this exact variation of the problem in its training data. And it involves this cube. So I have a toy cube here to give you a visualization. But you have to imagine you have a cube that has a potential set to a certain value, a constant value on its top face and a certain value on its bottom face. So I use these pretty funny numbers here to be the boundary conditions. The thing about this kind of problem is that the boundary conditions will dictate what the answer looks like. In the X and the Y directions, we have what is known as Dirichlet boundary conditions. That is, the function is specified on the boundaries that we are given. So at x equals 0 and x equals l, y equals 0, y equals l, the function is just equal to 0. That just matches with the picture that we've drawn here. And because of this boundary condition, this is a well-known solution. So we know this is basically like a particle in a box kind of model. So we know that the answers are going to be sign functions based on these boundary conditions. The same can't be said about the z-direction because it has non-zero boundary conditions. Now, I got a little bit lazy, and so I didn't finish the problem in Notion, but I did write it down. So we're going to look at my written solution here. And so the way to solve this problem is to effectively recognize you can use the principle of superposition. You can effectively solve the problem by setting pretty much every face to be zero except for one face, like in this case, we set the potential to be zero on the z equals zero face, and we set it to be the, the same value as it was in the original problem up here. And then we do the opposite, right? Where we set the top face to be zero and the bottom face to be the value on the other problem. And by 
using the principle of superposition, we can just add the solutions to these separate problems and get the final answer. So that's the way I went about solving it. And I'm not gonna bore you with all the mathematical details. It's a fairly standard approach, but is very lengthy and requires care when you solve the problem. You have to match the boundary conditions. You have to recognize you have a Fourier uh, sign series that you have to use orthogonality conditions to extract the coefficient and come up with the final answer. You also recognize that because it's a sign series, uh, n is going to be odd or your integers are going to be odd because sine is an odd function and so you don't have any even terms. And therefore the first solution, again just assuming for the boundary condition that you have up here, it is in this boxed form. And if you use the second condition where we assume that the potential at the top is zero and it has the boundary condition at the z equals zero face, then you go through a very similar process, not exactly the same, but a very similar process, and you get another expression for the potential. And then you essentially add the two to get this very unwieldy infinite series expression as your final answer. Again, this is what you would do. It's long, it's tedious, you can easily make a mistake. I made quite a few mistakes doing this just because there's so many things to keep track of. But nevertheless, when you sum this series up, and you want to figure out in this problem, I, I was asking what is the uh, potential at the center at the cube. Uh, if you use Mathematica to sum up these terms and just see what the first finite few terms are, the answer is basically just the average of the cube on all the six sides. So because of that, there's only two sides that actually have non-zero values, and so you add them up, divide them by six, and so the value at the center of the cube should be the average of all the six different faces of their electric static potentials. So it should be roughly 12,000 or 11,800. And this was me just taking my answer, summing it all up. And indeed, this is what you would get. This is actually what it looks like if you plot it all out. So the very center of the cube is where it's at its uh, sort of maximum value. And so uh, this is the answer that we're kind of looking for from all the different AI models. So first up, I did test O1 Pro. So O1 Pro was the first model I gave it to. It did, I thought, for about 10 and a half minutes. Uh, and based on all of its um, steps, it indeed got the right answer. It's kind of hard to see here just because it switched between using LaTeX and and uh, not LaTeX here. But effectively, if I, if I actually put this into LaTeX, let me see if I can pull that up. Right, so I believe this is, yeah, this is O1 Pro's answer. So if we plug in this expression, which is actually a little bit different from the answer that I have, because you're solving differential equations, you can have different expressions that are actually equivalent to each other because of all the different trigonometric functions and properties. Uh, and so even though the answers may not look exactly the same, they may indeed actually be equivalent to each other. And sure enough, if we plug this into Mathematica, again, using the same kind of trick where we just sum up these finite amount of terms. Indeed, you do get, you know, roughly 11,800. Okay, so what about for DeepSeq R1? So DeepSeq R1 was also given this problem. Go up here. And it thought for, let's see, that's roughly eight-ish, eight minutes, 26 seconds, right? And the thing that I think that's really interesting about DeepSeq is that it, it it will say wait, right? Like wait a lot. Wait, actually, let's compute the term inside. It's honestly really cool to see, but it's also uncanny to read its text because it, it just reads very human-like. Like I feel like I'm reading somebody's thought process here and says, wait, let me verify. Wait, let's compute. There's always this wait coming up. And it, it does take a while. And it does end up with an expression that looks, uh, again, slightly different from what I got and what OpenAI L1 Pro got. But again, if you evaluate this solution in uh, Mathematica, you look at the value at the center. So where did I have DeepSeq R1's answer? If you do that, you also get roughly 11,800, which is, it's really cool to see because actually when I look at this solution now, um, this part up here is indeed equivalent to what I had. But it went further. To, it went further and simplified the answer at the center here. I didn't. I didn't even bother to do this. I just started to evaluate this unwieldy expression. Yeah, uh, DeepSeq R1 got it. Really impressive that it solved this problem. I don't know. I found it very impressive. Maybe people might just think, oh, you know, it was probably in the training data. But I digress. If we look at how Gemini 2.0 did 
the flash thinking experimental model it did it really quickly like it thought for only i believe 33 seconds to think and then to output it only took about 36 seconds so about a minute right like much less time but if you actually evaluate its work here and you look at its final answer it does not actually get the right answer at the center of the cube it, it actually thinks it should just be the average of the two faces of the cube that have non-zero potentials it, it it's wrong it should actually be it should be this value over six not over two so it's it's actually off by a factor of three in the end and so despite it being really quick it did, it just wasn't as accurate as either DeepSeek r1 or openai 01 pro okay i know that was a lot to take in and i went kind of quickly because i just wanted to sort of show you the results of how DeepSeek performed compared to openai and uh, google's models but i'd like to end with just my take on the DeepSeek situation you know i was informed by someone in my family today who told me that they wanted to pull out completely of their shares of NVIDIA because they saw NVIDIA's stock price dip down quite significantly because of the news of DeepSeek. And I think that DeepSeek would make me worried if I was the CEO of an AI company in America, just because if you think about it, if DeepSeek can do even 90% of what, let's say, O1 or O1 Pro can do, but for the cost of $0 and 0 cents compared to $200 a month, I think that would seriously affect our you know, revenue stream as a company. Now, do I think that the industry in Silicon Valley is completely doomed? I don't think so. I mean, I think it's just a wake-up call, and I think they're going to have to respond in force to meet the challenge. I mean, OpenAI still hasn't released O3 Mini or O3 Pro, so we don't know how that's going to perform on these kinds of questions. And I think that uh, we're just in for a very exciting year. I mean, the first month of the year is not even done yet, and we already have this happening. So uh, I hope you found this video to be somewhat informative, somewhat entertaining. I know I went a little bit quickly for the physics. I apologize for that. I just wanted to go over just the main points of the problem and show how DeepSeek was able to uh, ultimately get the right answer. So if you like videos like this, uh, let me know. I could do more physics testing of this sort of level of detail where I actually have to solve the problem and verify it. It does take a while because these are graduate level physics problems and I haven't been a graduate student in a few years. So uh, these problems do take a, a bit to solve, but I do enjoy doing them. It does make me miss doing physics. And so just let me know in the comments if you'd like to see more testing like this. So uh, with that being said, I'd like to wish you all a good night and I will see you in the next video. See you next time.